Hello there and welcome to part 8 of my read through of Herbert Wilf's textbook Generating Functionology. I'm going to begin today by going over that, that point I said I wish to address in the last part where um, concerning the infinite summation of the claim of the formula Bn equals sum from r is 1 to infinity r to the n over r factorial and uh, all multiplied by 1 over e and they didn't really prove this in the book they what we had we so this is question mark on this what we proved in the book was that bn Or two. So for all sufficiently large m, which is m greater than equal to n, r to the n over r factorial s goes from m minus to m minus r minus one to the s over s factorial. We've proven this. But in the book, they just said taking m, taking it as m goes to infinity. So, and basically what they took that to mean was just literally plugging in the symbol infinity wherever m occurs. And so we had this thing, they seem to imply that obviously that this was equal to, so just plugging in infinity in place of the symbol m. And this bit here was equal to 1 over e from the, the well-known power series of the exponential function. However, my claim is that you can't just do this in general. You have two sums uh, and the index, the upper index on this part of the sum depends on r. It's, it's more complicated than that. So you need to be, you need to work much, you need to work harder to show that this is true. Because this, this statement here, so taking the limit as m goes to infinity of this thing is not the same as this. Because, so we know that the limit as m goes to infinity of sum r from 1 to m r to the m over r factorial. Okay, that pen's gone in the bin. Uh, I've got a replacement, this is exactly the same as that one. Uh, where were we? r to the n over r factorial. Ugh. Come on, there we go. Sum from s equals 0 to m minus r. Maybe this pen will be going in the bin as well in a minute. Keeps acting like this. Bloody hell, come on. Okay. We know that this is true. Because, as I say, as I said before, the sufficiently large m, this, this part here is constantly bn. So, this is true. But... This thing here is not the same as this. This here is specifically, you could say, um, limit as n1 goes to infinity, sum from r equals 1 to n1, or to the n over r factorial, times the limit as n2 goes to infinity, sum from s equals 0 to n2. So this is shorthand for this. And as it now written out like this, it's quite clear that this and this is not necessarily the same thing. You have two limits going on here, whereas 
this thing you've only got one limit going down so you need you need to do something to show that it's true so I've worked that I've worked it out and I've, um, I've written it up as well and I'll link to the PDF file um, and so let, let's begin so for shorthand because we're going to be uh, otherwise we'll be writing a lot of stuff out we're going to let SM be the sum from R is 1 to M this thing here and this one to the S over S factorial and what we're going to do is we're going to give notation here for splitting this sum into two parts so I'll define AM and BM so AM A and B will depend on two variables so AM N will be defined as sum from R is 1 to N So I'll just, put, I'll just mention, um, we're assuming here that n is less than or equal to m. So sum from r is 1 to n, of r to the n over r factorial, and then this part, same as before. And bnn is the second part of this sum, so the sum from r is n plus 1 to m. Um, so this is just splitting the sum SM into two parts and the second variable N allows us to split it at a different place. So we have that for all N, M and N less than equal to M that SM is equal to A, M, N plus B, M, N. So I've just set up this notation here to make things a little easier to work with. So, first I'm going to look at BMN. So, BMN, let's write it out once more. So, it's R from N plus 1 to M. Um, and if M is greater than or equal to N, we can write M as N plus n prime for some n prime so i'm going to write it in that form go to n plus n prime r to the n over r factorial s sum from zero to n plus n prime minus r minus one to the s over s factorial so i'm going to change a variable here i'm going to sum t from 1 to n prime so I'm replacing r with t plus n it's just the same thing so t plus again t plus n factorial s equals 0 and so this is so r has become t plus n so this is it goes up to n prime minus t minus 1 to the s over s factorial Now, it's fairly easy to show that if we keep n prime constant, then this thing goes to zero as n goes to infinity, big n goes to infinity. Um, I provide a proof of this in the file I've attached. Can Either do it as an exercise or look it up in there. It's fairly straightforward. And so this this is a, a finite sum. Um, of course, it's a finite sum. But what I mean is, uh, as n goes to infinity, sorry, t only ever takes finitely many different values when when this occurs so since this goes to infinity we have the limit as 
n goes to infinity, n plus n prime, b n plus n prime, n equals zero. And this will hold for any n prime or n prime, which was, yeah, so I'll leave it like that for the time being. So now I'm going to look at the first part of the sum, a. And so I'm going to look at a n prime plus n. And let's look at this. So I'll write this out. Sum from R is 1 to n prime plus ah, goes to, to n, sorry. The first part of the sum, because we've got an n here. R to the n over R factorial. Sum from s is 0 to n plus n prime minus r minus 1 to the s over s factorial. Now the way this, this proof is going, so as you see the idea is to, this, this bn thing we're going to say, it's going to be going to zero, so we're hoping, the reason I'm splitting up the sum is that in the first part of the sum I want all the interesting stuff and in the second part I want it to be negligible. So if as r goes from 1 to n, n minus r is always going to be positive. So the upper index in this sum is always going to be greater than or equal to n prime. Bear that in mind. So if n prime was taken large enough, this thing here is going to be very close. So very close to e to the minus 1 because this sum converges to e to the minus 1. So that's the reasoning for splitting the sum up. So in the first part, we're going to have this bit close to e to the minus 1. So bearing that in mind, I'm going to consider the difference between this part and e to the minus 1. So let's see. So I'm going to look at the absolute value of a n prime plus n n minus e to the minus 1 and then I'm sticking in this sum r from 1 to n r to the n minus r factorial. So since a n prime plus n n is equal to this thing Every, we've got the sum r to the n over r factorial as r goes from 1 to n in both here and here. So I can rearrange this. This is equal to sum r from 1 to n r to the n over r factorial. And then we have this bit. This from 0 to n plus n prime minus r minus 1 to the s over s factorial minus e to the minus 1. Okay. And so, and again, remember this bit here is greater than or equal to n prime. And so as n prime gets big, this thing here is going to get small. So um, to make this a little more rigorous, what I'm going to do is define alpha function of integers in prime to be the supremum of the differences between s from 0 to n minus 1 to the s over s factorial and e to the minus 1 for all n greater than or equal to n prime. So this is always going to be a finite value because this thing converges to this and also since this thing converges to this alpha n prime will go to zero as n prime goes to infinity okay Looking at this, then, we see that this value here, because this, this 
upper index is greater than or equal to n prime is going to be less than or equal to uh, alpha n prime. So taking this first, I will say this is use the triangle inequality. So this is less than or equal to sum from r from one to n r to the n over r factorial. So n plus n prime minus r minus 1 to the s over s factorial minus e to the minus 1 by the triangle inequality. And then this bit here is less than or equal to alpha n prime. So less than or equal to alpha n prime sum of from 1 to n. And since all the terms in this sum are positive, this is also just so we've got it in a form not depending on n, less than or equal to the sum from r1 to infinity. And this is also a finite value because this sum converges. Um, easy to prove via the ratio test. Now I've also I've also put that in my PDF file. So either an exercise or you can look it up. Okay, so with what we have then is, so let's go back to here. This thing here, so for all, for all n prime, so so for all n prime, greater than or equal to zero. The absolute value between a n prime plus n n minus e to the minus one r from one to n r to the n over n factorial is less than or equal to alpha n prime sum from r is one to infinity r to the n over r factorial. So this is true for all n prime. So it in particular is true for the limb sup as n prime goes to infinity. So, so limb sup as n prime goes to infinity. This thing, so n prime plus n, n. Ah, I mean to take the limit of as n goes to infinity. This is not only true for all n prime greater than or equal to zero. It's also true for all n greater than or equal to zero as well. We we never used any assumptions that any any of these values had to be a certain size. So sorry about that. Um, so taking the limit of as n goes to infinity, it's it's still going to hold. going to be. So for all n prime greater than or equal to zero, this holds. Right. Now, since we have the, the limit as n goes to infinity of b n prime plus n, n was zero, we can stick this b n prime plus n n into this sum, and it won't affect the limb sub because the limb sub of this is the same as the limit. So we can just stick it in. So, so limb sub n goes to infinity. So you're going to have a n prime plus n n plus b n prime plus n n minus e to the minus 1 r from 1 to n r to the n over r factorial. Uh, also I can do the same, I can now change this to infinity because this sum as n goes to infinity converges precisely to this value and for the same reason limbs up 
of this guy here is going to be equal to its limit so we can just replace it in the limps up so now we have that this is less than or equal to alpha and prime sum from r equals 1 to infinity r to the n over r factorial sorry and now if you remember this thing here was split it was just splitting up I'll sum s n prime plus n into two parts. So, in particular, now we can just say, well, this is the same as lim sup m goes to infinity, s m minus e to the minus 1, r from 1 to infinity, r to the n over r factorial. And still less than or equal to this and since we know that the limit of this as m goes to infinity is just bn we have that the limit which is just bn minus e to the minus 1 r from 1 to infinity r to dn over r factorial is less than or equal to alpha n prime in this sum Now, this holds for all n prime. However, this part here does not depend on n prime at all. The n prime only occurs over here. And this goes to zero as n prime goes to infinity. So the only way this can be true, I mean, this, this is now a constant term, it never varies, is if this constant term is zero. So therefore, we have shown that bn is indeed equal to e to the minus 1 sum r from 1 to infinity r to dn over r factorial. So I hope that was clear. I hope I, I uh, proved that in a, in a nice clear way. If anyone else knows, uh, can, can find a proof of this result which is, I don't know, simpler or easier to understand at a first glance then feel free to share it with me. That'd be great. I did try this proof in a few different ways and in the end I decided this this notation and doing it in this way is the simplest and the clearest way to, to go about it. So yeah I mean as you see that, that took a little bit of work and so I, I'm I think it's a it's a bit of an error on the on the alpha there because they didn't make any hint at all that there was any work involved. They just said, oh, taking m to infinity. Whereas that's, you can't just do that. And it doesn't even say that this isn't quite how it works. You need to prove this properly. Or, you know, it, I can understand that they don't want to stick all this stuff in their introductory chapter, which is just motivation, motivating chapter for the rest of the book. But, but then it's a nice example. And a lot of people who might some people might be looking at the book just to look at this particular example they might be interested in bowel numbers in this formula and they might know that that has it in the introduction in that book and they'll either be unhappy with the proof because it doesn't cover this or they might think it is a valid proof incorrectly and so i think that's it's a bit yeah not happy about that to be honest but there you go filled in that gap Moving on, the x d by dx log operation. One, take the logarithm of both sides of the equation. Two, differentiate both sides and multiply through by x. Three, clear the equation of fractions. Four, for each n, find the coefficient of x to the n on both sides of the equation and equate them. Okay. So what does this mean? So if we have an equation, ah, so I'm guessing we're going to be applying this to 1.6.12. So before we go ahead, I'm going to see, see what happens if we try that.
So we had some from n equals 0 to infinity, b n over n factorial, x to the n equals e to the e to the x minus 1. So take the logarithm of both sides of the equation. Hmm. OK, well, yeah, well yeah, let's do that. So log log of the left hand side. And we lose an e here, so e to the x oh, minus 1. We go down a down a level of ease and differentiate both sides. Yeah, if we differ, differentiate the right hand side, uh, it just stays as e to the x and the one disappears. Differentiate the left hand side. Well, let me think. Um, the derivative of the log of a function. So d by dx log fx say. We use chain rule, it's going to be the derivative of f over fx, isn't it? So the derivative of this left hand side here is going to be d by dx uh, this guy divided by the original function. Okay. Um, um, what's the derivative of this? Let's just work that out. So this is equal to sum n equals zero to infinity b n over n factorial times n x to the n minus 1 and then stays the same on the bottom and this is equal to e to the x and here so at uh, n here dividing top and bottom by n this becomes n minus 1 factorial so we get n equals 0 to infinity b n over n minus 1 factorial x to the n minus 1 equals e to the x um, ooh, I shouldn't have done that for n equals 0 for n equals 0 this would have just been 0, and I can't cancel out 0 divided by 0, so uh, I'll take it from n equals 1. Divide this by n equals 0 to infinity bn over n factorial x to the n. Hmm. So, as n goes from 1 to infinity, n minus 1 goes from 0 to infinity. So this becomes n from 0 to infinity b n plus 1 over n minus 1 factorial x to the n over so we have this so what did it say clearly the equation of fractions well I'm guessing that means to take this up to here, but anyway, let's see what they do. It seems like it's probably what they're going to be doing. So, although the, mes the best motivation for the above program is the fact that it works, let's pause for a moment before doing it and see why it is likely to work. The point of taking logarithms to simplify the function e to the e to the x minus 1, whose power series coefficients are quite mysterious before taking logarithms and are quite obvious after doing so. The price for that simplification is that on the left hand, left hand side we have a log of the sum which is an awesome thing to have. So why? Why is it an awesome thing to have? I don't know. Let's, go, let's continue. 
The next step, the differentiation, changes the log of the sum into a ratio of two sums, which is much nicer. So yeah, just like, so as we did, we had um, Oh, I must I missed out the log in, in my writing here, so log. No, nope. no I didn't, no I didn't. That was right. So yeah, we had the log on this log on this side, differentiate both sides and became the ratio the two two sums. Yeah, that's what happened. Um the reason for multiplying through by x is that the differentiation dropped the power of x by one. So, oh yes, differentiate both sides and multiply, multiply through by x. Okay. Um, well, I accounted for the difference by changing the sum rather than multiplying it through by x. So let's multiply it through by x instead. Uh, then, oh, I left that as minus 1, that should have changed to n. So if, if all I'd done was multiply through by x here, I'd still be going from n equals 1 to infinity. And this, this coefficient would stay the same. I'd made a mistake before doing it. As I had done before, I should have changed that to n, and I hadn't. Um, yeah. OK. Now what they're saying next. So the reason for multiplying through by x is that the differentiation dropped the power of x by 1 and it's handy to restore it. After clearing the fractions, we will simply be looking at two sums that are equal to each other. And the work will be over. Okay, so guessing by clearing the fractions, I mean rewriting it in the form n equals 1 to infinity bn over n minus 1 factorial x to the n equals e to the x n equals 0 to infinity bn over n factorial x to the n and we know the power series form of e to the x it's sum for n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial so I'm guessing what we're going to be doing is multiplying this power series and this power series together and seeing what it tells us about the sequence bn by equating powers of x on both, on both sides. So let's see if this is what they do. So they then go through what we just did. So they took logs of both sides, they differentiate both sides, and then they... Ah uh, yeah, because they're, they're not keeping track of their indices. So maybe it makes more sense for them to multiply through by x. No, it's the same. It's the same thing. Um, clear the fractions. Multiply both sides by the denominator on the left. Ah, I didn't multiply the right-hand side by x. So x e to the x on the, on the right-hand side. Okay. So now what I've got here is looking the same as what they have. So they left this n minus 1 factorial in the form n over n factorial. Maybe that's handy for when they equate coefficients. Right, so... Finally, we have to identify the coefficients of x to the n on both sides of this equation. On the left, it's easy. On the right, we have to multiply two power series together and then identify the coefficient. Since in chapter 2 we will work out a general and quite easy to use ruling rule for doing things like this, let's postpone this calculation to then and merely quote the result here. It is that the bell numbers satisfy the recurrence Bn, Bn equals sum over k of n minus 1, choose k, b k. Now I guess we can take k from 0 to n, n minus 1. And they say this is valid for n greater than or equal to 1, and we have that b0 equals 1.
This formula here is reminding me of um, the formula I had. I came up with an equivalence relation for the the N and K and curly brackets in one of my earlier episodes when I was trying to work it out for myself ahead of a book. I wonder if that equivalence, um, that re recurrence relation I had for these, which was which was in terms of the binomial coefficient and the sum over them, though I don't think it was quite the same. So maybe if I sum them together via some, because um, since bn is equal to sum from k equals 0 to n of n and k in curly brackets, perhaps if I'd sum the, all of these together of k with my recurrence relation from before, some sort of algebraic manipulation, I can obtain this. I'll have to have a little look at that, because that'll be interesting. Um, but it's, it's easy to multiply these two together, and they say we're going to postpone it until chapter two. Well, I'm going to give it a bash now, because uh, it's easy to do that. So let's see. What do we have? On the right-hand side, x e to the x. Sum from n equals 0 to infinity, bn over n factorial, x to the n. That's on the right hand side. Uh, and this, this bit here, so I'm going to rewrite this in its power series form. So x times n equals 0 to infinity, x to the n over n factorial. Okay, what is the coefficient of x to the m? So no, I'll stop saying m. Um, it's really difficult to tell between when I say m and n. Uh, but what's the coefficient of x to the alpha? Coefficient of x to the alpha. Well, what we need to do is look at uh, coefficients when the sums of the powers of the x's in this product are equal to alpha. So what we'd need is we'd need um, 1, because the power of this is just 1, plus the power of x here. So we call this, oh, just change the notation, n1 here and n2 here, n2, so that I can distinguish between the two n's. So what we'd need is we need 1 plus n1 plus n2. to equal alpha, or n1 plus n2 to equal alpha minus 1. And we would sum over each, each uh, such occurrence. So you would say you'd be summing, so the coefficient of x to the alpha, I'll just write that as this, coefficient of x to the alpha, Will be will be um, sum over all n1 greater than or equal to zero, n2 greater than or equal to zero, such that n1 plus n2 equals alpha minus one of one over n1 factorial times b n2 over n2 factorial. So it's a 
factorial there. Okay. And what is what is this sum? Well, we can take n1, say, to go from alpha from i equals zero to alpha minus one. So let's say it's equal to sum of n1 goes from zero to alpha minus one, and then we'd have that uh, y over n1 factorial. Then n2 would have to be n1 minus so if we rearrange this for n2, we'd have that n2 would be equal to alpha minus 1 minus n1. So we'd have b alpha minus 1 minus n1 over n2 factorial. Right. So this is what the coefficient of x to the alpha would be in the right hand side of this equation, assuming I didn't make any mistakes. So let's equate the coefficients to the left hand side. Hmm. So the left hand side here was simply, so we'd have for uh, all, all alpha, all Alpha, say so alpha greater than equal to zero. But bear in mind that when alpha is zero, then this is an empty sum. So it's a zero on the right hand side, which makes sense because this equation here has no constant term divisible by x. So we would have b. Hmm, b alpha over alpha minus one factorial. Though no, no, I need to write this in a different form if alpha is zero. So b alpha times alpha over alpha factorial, because obviously if alpha was zero, I can't divide zero by zero, is equal to n one from zero to alpha minus one, one over n one factorial. B alpha minus 1 minus n1 over n2 factorial. n2 was alpha minus 1 minus n1 factorial. I hadn't written it in that form there, just written n2. Okay. Um, if I multiply both sides here by. Hmm. Okay, let me think. So this is already looking a little bit like binomial coefficient um, because n choose k in general is n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial. So what is the sum of this and this? n1, that should have been an n1 there. n1 plus this is alpha minus 1. So it's going to be something like alpha minus 1, choose n1, because that is alpha minus 1 factorial over n1 factorial times, yep, alpha minus 1 minus n1 factorial, yeah. So all I need to do is divide by 1 over alpha minus 1 factorial to get the coefficient in here. So what we have is that for all alpha greater than or equal to 0, though this equation stops holding true when alpha is 0 because I've got a minus 1 at the top, which for which not this notation stops making sense there. So now it's for all alpha greater than or equal to 1, we have, so what was the equation we had? b alpha times, well now because alpha is greater than or equal to 1 I can do, take alpha out of the top and the bottom here, so it becomes what over alpha minus 1 factorial. 
So now this is looking good, isn't it? This is equal to sum from n1 equals 0 to alpha minus 1 of um, b alpha minus 1 minus n1 over okay so I'm not going to write over I'm going to write well yeah I'm going to write over alpha minus 1 factorial times alpha minus 1 and choose uh, choose then one okay so now I can take it alpha minus 1 factorial out of both sides and this appears to give us that occurrence relation so let's see if this is the same thing so b alpha equals sum from okay I'm gonna say k equals 0 to alpha minus 1 of b alpha minus 1 minus k alpha minus 1 choose k and I'm going to sum this backwards to see if I get the same thing as what they had so sum from let's go right k equals 0 to alpha minus 1 um, so if I just reverse the order of the sum then this is going to be alpha 1 choose alpha minus 1 minus k which incidentally is equal to um, that because uh, due to this formula here you have that n choose k is always equal to n choose n minus k so summing it backwards does not affect the uh, binomial coefficient here but, um, but it will affect this this will become bk and yeah yeah that's exactly what they had, I believe. Um, so you can just write this as alpha 1 choose k. And is that what they have? They have n instead of alpha bn. Sum from k is 0 to well, n minus 1 will do. Uh, n minus 1 choose k, bk. Yeah, so that works. And that's a really cool formula. So I wouldn't, I'm just going to have a look to see if my formula from the earlier episode um, that I came up with can be used to obtain obtain this occurrence relation as well. So I've had a little think about that. It didn't take me very long. And if you go back to part six, episode number six, about 26 minutes in, it's where I start talking about this stuff. It was where uh, we were looking at um, N and K. Number of ways to partition n into k classes, and um, I was trying to work out a recurrence relation for this by considering. So I'm um, I'm going to let g I'm going to call a function g n k r. This is going to be equal to the number of partitions partitions of n such that number of partitions of n um, okay into into k classes such that the class containing n is of size r so contains r elements so for example so g i'll say that again so g n k r um, let that be the number of partitions of n such that the class containing n contains r elements. So, into k classes. So, for example, um, g n k 1 
is the number of partitions of n into k classes, where n lies in a class containing only one element. So that means n occurs in the singleton class in our partition of n, which must mean the remaining n minus 1 of them, n minus 1 elements in this set, must form the other k minus 1 partitions. So g1 will therefore be equal to, let's say it's going to be n minus 1, k minus 1 in curly brackets. And if you go back to where I was talking in part 6, so it's about 26, 26 minutes in. I'm reading that section of the book. Um, this is their pile one. This is their pile where n lies in a class of its own. But in general, for r or any r between so one is less than r less than or equal to n, um, let's calculate what g and k r will be in that case. So g and k r. So if n lies in a set, a class of r elements, how many such um, uh, sets are there of size r? How many subsets of the set n of size r which contain the element n are there? Well, you've already got n, and then there's, you need to choose another r minus 1 elements from the remaining n minus 1 of them. So it's n minus 1, choose r minus 1. And then, so that's uh, your class with n in, and then you need another k minus 1 classes out of the remaining n minus r elements. So in general, we have a g, n, k, r is equal to this value, which gives us the following formula, the recurrence formula for n, k, and curly brackets. So r from 1 to n um, g, n, k, r because uh, this is this is uh, going to cover all of all of the partitions of the set of n elements into k classes, which is just sum from r equals one to n, n minus one choose r minus one, n minus r, k minus one. This is the recurrence formula that I found myself before um, when I when I tried to work out my own recurrence relation before I read. To see how the book did it. So I had this and this reminded me very much of the recurrence relation that we came up with just then. So we, what we had was uh, b, bn is a sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1. I think it's n minus 1 choose k, bk. Now I thought oh well this, this looks pretty familiar. <laughs> it reminded me of this. So I was wondering firstly can I use this to get this? And the answer is yes. It's pretty easy actually. Um, so let's let's try that. So bn for for n greater than or equal to one. Bn is just sum from k equals one to n of n k which is equal to sum from k2 onto n of this formula that we, we calculated earlier. So this one here, so r from 1 to n, n minus 1, r minus 1, n minus r, k minus r. Um, we're almost there already. All we need to do is just rearrange a little bit. So let's see. We can sort the summation around because we're summing over rectangle. So sort from sum from r equals one to n. We can take the n minus one, choose r minus one out. It doesn't depend on k. So then sum from k from one to n. Okay. Uh, and this value here. 
is always going to just be b n minus r. Um, as k minus 1 exceeds n minus r, that's fine. It's, it's just going to be 0, so it's not going to affect the sum. So what we have already is that this is equal to the sum from r is 1 to n, n minus 1, r minus 1, b, n minus r. And then it's just a matter of rearranging. So which is so let's take the from r equals zero to n minus one instead and shift accordingly so we're replacing so it's r goes from one to n r minus one goes from zero to n minus one b n minus r plus one okay B n minus one minus r. Right. So I'm just gonna reorder reorder this sum. N minus one minus r B R. And this term here is just equal to N minus one choose R. So we have the recurrence relation. And this was equal to Bn. Then this is exactly the right thing we're after. And so, um, yeah, that, I think that's easier than the way we went about it in the book. Uh, didn't need any generating of functions, generating functions at all for that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but it turns out that you can actually prove this formula even easier. You don't even need to consider the n, k, and curly brackets at all. You can do almost exactly the same thing. We don't need n and k. You can do almost exactly the same thing without it. So, if let's say let h n r, just like g n k r, but without k. So h n r be the number of partitions of n such that so not of k classes anymore such that n belongs to a class of um, r elements and just as before so what's h n r well how many sets are there of size r containing n just like before there's n minus one choose r minus one of them and um then you've got n minus r remaining elements left and we can take any partition of them we're not we don't care about the size of our partition anymore so we have this and and we let's see so mm. so then we can just say well bn is a sum from r equals one to n of h n r which is sum from r equals one to n of n minus one r minus one b n minus r and um that's what we what we had I think before. Yep, yeah, so it's just equal to uh, it's the same rearrangement as before. It equals something k equals zero to n minus one, n minus one k b k. Easy. So yeah, I thought that was nice to add as well. Um I've put those proofs in the same PDF file that I did some work in earlier, which I'm going to link um, in the description of this video so that you can download it. Let's read further then. Um, almost at the end of section 1.6. So 
We have now seen several examples of how generating functions can be used to find recurrence relations. It often happens that the method of generating functions finds a recurrence, and only later we are able to give a direct combinatorial interpretation of recurrence. So I guess that kind of, I mean, say we've been searching for this uh, argument that I, that I used here and we couldn't do it, you know, we were stuck. And the only recurrence formula we were able to find was the one for NK. And this would be an example of that. And then we'd have this recurrence relation, which does look uh, combinatorically inviting and maybe it would enable us to come up with a cunning argument. Um, so it's kind of what happened here. But uh, yeah, I think if, if I'd been challenged with the um, task of finding the recurrence relation for BN, I would have very quickly come up with this in the same way I came up with almost that, that same recurrence relation for NK in part six that I mentioned earlier. So, and only later are we able to give a direct combinatorial interpretation of a recurrence. In some cases, recurrences are known that look like they ought to have a simple combinatorial uh, look like they ought to have simple combinatorial explanations, but none have yet been found. So that's that's cool. Though. I'd like to see some examples of that, especially if something has a comes out with a nice, elegant-looking sum like this, and no one's been able to find a counting argument to prove that. That would be very interesting. And that, so yeah, that that that's the end of section one point six then. Um, the end of chapter one of the exercises so that was that was quite fun uh, there's a few mis few what I consider mistakes mostly tiny things but one one fairly substantial mistake in my opinion that I addressed at the start of this video but other than that that's quite fun um, we didn't need all the generating function stuff to get this recurrence relation, but it was nice because without that, we wouldn't know that the uh, exponential generating function of the bell numbers was e to the e to the x minus one, which is quite interesting. Um, so yeah, that was that was quite fun. Um, I am going to do the exercises. I don't know what they like. There seem to be quite a lot of them. So I'm going to start with 20 questions. I'm going to start with 21, actually. Um, I'm going to start working through the exercises and I'll make videos of me working through them. Um, assuming it doesn't take me too long to do each question. If I find that it's taking me absolutely forever to get through the 20 questions, I may go on to chapter two before I finish them, but I do think I'd like to go through the exercises. And there might be interesting stuff that isn't covered, interesting examples that aren't really covered in the in this introduction. So, yeah, I think it'd be good to go through. So I'm going to stop there. It's a natural place to stop. Thanks for watching. And um, see you next time.